1st of July it all kicked off and everybody's got to be compliant by the 2nd of August. The way it's kind of said is like you can't even get in touch, you can't check anything, but that's not quite the full story. Whilst as an industry we don't love what's coming, the sky isn't falling. If someone's doing the wrong thing, there's still avenues to be protected as the landlord. Absolutely. If you're wanting to terminate a tenancy, you can only terminate it under quite specific prescribed reasons. Come and learn from Beck Day, our Adelaide property management expert, GM of Trove Property Management, as she shares with us insights into the overhaul that's happening in Adelaide's rental legislation changes. It's really clear in the legislation that, yes, a tenant is responsible for any pet damage. So there's definitely still protection there for a landlord. Yes, correct. Proving that not everything is always as it seems. And sometimes you need an expert to go through the details in a fine tooth comb to just really understand what's going on. At the end of the day, a landlord will choose the best applicant that is put forward to them. What we are concerned about as an industry is... So if you're an Adelaide property investor or about to become one, this episode, you're going to get an understanding of the new rental legislation changes, but what they really mean. My name's Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast. And you're listening to my chat with property manager, Beck Day. Beck Day. Big news. How you going? Yeah, pretty good, thanks. How about yourself? Yeah, very good, thank you. There's been some changes lately in South Australia as far as the, the rental reform is concerned. Yes, there has. 1st of July, it all kicked off and everybody's got to be compliant by the 2nd of August, I think it is. And I've been wanting to get you on the show as soon as I've seen this. So actually, big thank you for making the time to come down because I know that your schedule is pretty full at the moment. You guys are doing a lot. But I wanted to really pick your brains on a few of the main changes what they are, but also, I guess, the realities of it. Because a lot of the time when stuff like this happens, it can kind of be communicated as if the sky is falling. And then you go, well, wait a second, actually, here's how it works from a professional's point of view. And you're like, oh, okay, maybe that's not so bad. So if you don't mind, is there anything you wanted to sort of set the stage with before we kick off this list of four? Oh, look, I think exactly what you just said. You know, whilst as an industry, we don't love what's coming, the sky isn't falling and mm. we are, you know, agents are well placed if they've done their research and their homework to strategize and put in place new systems to, to make these reforms still be really effective for landlords and tenants. All right, so with that in mind, why don't we kick it off with the changes around pets in South Australia? So basically now, if a tenant wants a pet, they have to apply mm -hmm. and a landlord cannot reasonably refuse their pet application. So, um, Talk to me about what reasonably is. Yeah, that's interesting. But say, for example, the property is a strata property mm -hmm. and the strata bylaws say no pets, then that is a reasonable ground to deny the pet. Other examples that have been put forward to us would be um, if there is not adequate fencing for a pet or if the pet is inappropriate for the space. So say, for example, you want a really large dog in a tiny courtyard. Mm -hmm. um, other areas that possibly could be considered, say, for example, you have a landlord who's renting out their home and they want to return to that home if they genuinely are highly allergic and they um, can provide evidence of that, um, that the pet hair, for example, would um, be problematic even when they move back, then that would be a reasonable ground. The thing that I've always thought when it comes to pets is how many times people would actually have a pet and just not say anything. And they'd, they'd like hide the cat or they'd hide the dog or they'd hide whatever. So if it is just like a cat, a dog, like something that's pretty straightforward, I can't really feel that's going to be changing a hell of a lot, but isn't there some protection for the landlord around now tenants are actually responsible for any kinds of damage a pet causes if they do? Correct. So um, it's really clear in the legislation that, yes, a tenant is responsible for any pet damage. A good property manager will be, when they're doing their routine inspections, they will be looking for signs of pet damage, you know, clawed curtains, clawed um, scratched glass, damaged gardens, damaged floorboards and making sure that they're remedied during tenancy. And the reality is I believe over 50% of rental properties already have pets. We have a large contingent of them and the instances of pet damage, whilst they do occur, mm -hmm. they are not huge and I really don't think that this is going to be a big issue. I still remember when I went to, I think it was actually in real estate training college and, and we were talking about this and they're like, if you think pets are going to cause damage, wait until you have kids. 
It's kind of true. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, the, the, the big thing I'm hearing is if someone wants to rent the property and they've got like six pit bulls, you can still reasonably go like, come on, guys, this probably isn't, this probably isn't good. It's not going to happen. Absolutely. And the reality is that lots of councils have got restrictions on the number of pets anyway. So that may well exceed the number of pets that are in council by bylaws even. So that may be something to look at. And, you know, at the end of the day, a landlord will choose the best applicant that is put forward to them. Mm -hmm. And they may choose, you know, an applicant that didn't have the six pit bulls, but it doesn't stop their applicant that they did choose from then applying later to say, oh, we would like six pit bulls, but then they would reasonably refuse the six pit bulls. Yeah, makes sense. So before we move on to the next one, Beck, is there anything else people need to know about uh, the changes around pets in South Australia? I think it's important for landlords to have the confidence and understand that in the instance that a pet is not approved mm -hmm. and the tenant is caught with a pet at the premises, they are able to terminate the tenancy based on that ground. Um, it's a 90-day notice and um, so there is still you know, an avenue. Yeah, okay. So there's definitely still protection there for a landlord. Yes, correct. Okay. All right. That's nowhere near as bad. All right. What about reference checks? Now, this is a big change that when you first told me, I was like, oh, I don't know about this one. But again, kind of look into it a little bit further. It's not as bad as what it seems. Yeah. I mean, these are things that we are not loving. Um, however, like I discussed with you, there are ways that we can still verify things. So one of the changes is that we are now precluded from contacting a tenant's um, employer references mm -hmm. to make sure, which we would always do to, you know, check that they earn what they say they're earning and that they are still um, employed there um, when we're trying to determine affordability. However, a way around that now and we are also, sorry, um, only able to ask for two pieces of evidence supporting their income. And there are many instances where tenants have more than, you know, two jobs or two sources of income. So that's fairly frustrating in itself. So what we would be suggesting and what we will be doing is asking tenants to provide a redacted. So, you know, they remove their important information like bank mm -hmm. accounts and BSB numbers. All the personal stuff. Yeah, yep. but a bank statement that then can prove that they are being paid what they say they are being paid and that they are still employed. So so you might not be able to call the employer anymore, but you can still actually say, hey, can, can you still give me some proof? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, it's not really said that way. The way it's kind of said is like you can't even get in touch, you can't check anything, but that's not quite the full story. What we are concerned about as an industry is the tenant that has, for example, four sources of income, mm -hmm. reading that, oh, they only have to supply two pieces of evidence. And at the end of the day, if you are a landlord and you are, um, you know, needing to make a decision on which tenant you're going to put in your property – who are you going to choose, Todd? Are you going to choose the tenant that has provided you all of the evidence of all of their sources of income? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to choose one that, oh, they say that they've got these four sources, but I really can't tell. So we're really concerned that the change is going to It's not actually going to help who they're trying people. to help. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Correct. It's a frustrating piece of legislation. <laughs> I feel like it's going to be one of those things that, it, and you're right, there's going to be so many people that will follow it and just be like, well, this is what I'm told. And it's like, well, it's probably not really what you should be doing to put yourself in the best stead. But is do you think maybe it could be similar to, like, you're not allowed to say, hey, this place is advertised for 600. By the way, you should probably put in 620 if you really want a go of it. You're not allowed to do that. But if someone wants to put forward 610, 620, they are technically allowed to do that. Yes, they are. So if you've got people that are going, all right, what can I do to make this more attractive? As much as these are now like the, the laws that have been passed, this is what technically you're allowed to ask for, doesn't mean a tenant application can't actually consist of more. That's what's frustrating. So there will be heaps of applicants that, you know, provide more. Mm -hmm. We're just not allowed to ask for more. So my advice to anybody out there that is applying for a property, you know, always put the shoe on the other foot. And we do have plenty of our tenants are landlords and consider, you know, if, someone was applying for my property, what would I want to see? What would mm. I want to know? And, you know, whilst we might be precluded from asking, they're not, they can still provide it. Ending leases. Mm -hmm. This is a big one. Mm -hmm. Can you talk us through the changes there? The legislation prior to the 1st of July was at the end of a lease, we could 
um, basically terminate the lease without giving the tenant any reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would have to have a minimum of 28 days notice, mm-hmm. um, which in my opinion was not enough. 28 days isn't enough time for people to go and find alternate accommodation, particularly in this market. Mm-hmm. So now um, we are not able to do that. We have to pres- – um, if you're wanting to terminate a tenancy, you can only terminate it under quite specific – prescribed reasons. Um, so if it's just that you simply don't really love your tenant, too bad. So what are the primary four reasons? Exactly what they used to be for ending a periodic tenancy. Mm-hmm. So well, almost exactly. Um, so it will be 60 days notice if you are wanting to move back into the property as yourself or a direct family member. Okay. 60 days if you are demolishing. If you are carrying out major repairs or renovations to the property. Mm-hmm. And they have to be major. You can't just go in there and like paint the wall. Yeah, correct. Yep. And if you have a contract for sale. All right. So those are the main four, but are there any other reasons that you can actually give to not continue a lease? Yes, they have included quite a significant list um, of what they call prescribed reasons that are 90 day reasons that you would terminate your tenancy. Okay. I probably won't go through them all here. Um but the ones that we would be using that would be most relevant is if a tenant um, has successive breaches. So say, for example, this is where we would, if your tenant is consistently um, breaching their obligation for rental arrears, for example, or Mm -hmm. if they um, have consistently breached how they are supposed to be maintaining and caring for the premises, that would be our prescribed reason. Right, okay. And so if your PM is keeping on top of things like that, Again, this isn't like a, a tenant can basically just squat in the property forever. It's like if someone's doing the wrong thing, there's still avenues to be protected as the landlord. Absolutely. Right. Those avenues sound like they've they've just kind of changed. They've gone off into some side streets now that we need to follow. Correct. Right. Okay. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Lastly, inspections. How has that changed in South Australia? So they have limited the number of routine inspections that can be carried out um, and The majority of companies throughout Australia either conduct three routine or four routine inspections per year. Mm -hmm. Um, The maximum is now four. And my understanding is the reason that they have limited it is more so to do with private landlords um, that consistently were coming every three or four weeks to check up on their property. Um, The downside of this is that many agencies like Trove, um, we would utilise what we call a follow-up inspection, Mm -hmm. which is like an education process. You know, when you have a brand new tenant um, and they've never rented before or, you know, educating them on what their obligations are. So it might be that, you know, they've mowed the lawns, but inside is really filthy. And so we might say to them, look, we need you to do X, Y and Z and we'll be back in, you know... 14 days, you know, can you get this done? And And that's technically another inspection. Correct. Whereas we're now prevented from doing that quick little follow-up inspection. Um, But there are ways around that. Like we can have what we would refer to, like we've set it up in our software, um, a tenant-led inspection. So if it's something that we trust the tenant on and it's, uh, you know, just little, but we want to see them remedying it and we would ask the tenants to be taking photos to verify that, yep, that's been done. Mm -hmm. Or if it was something more significant that does require a follow-up inspection, we will serve um, a Form 5 Notice to Remedy breach and in that it means that we are able to then go back and inspect that they have remedied um, whatever it is that we're needing them to to fix. Okay, so you can go back again outside of the four as a maximum if a Form 5 is served. Basically, if there's a real problem that you're chasing, you still do have rights to go, no, wait a second, we need to fix this. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So okay. if there are things that are glaringly um, in breach of their tenancy agreement, Absolutely. If anything, Beck, this just sounds like it's more annoying for you guys than anyone. Like it's just more paperwork. <laughs> there is more paperwork and I guess it'll be about how we all as an industry manage and handle it. But um, I guess the part that I hate about it is nobody likes receiving these horrible notices. So mm. instead of us doing it in a positive manner and keeping all of our you know, tenants and landlords happy, our tenants are going to get these horrible forms and panic so um, it, it, it's just a change that we'll all have to adjust to. Okay. Well, as far as any questions that people have, if you want to go to trovepm.com.au forward slash blog, we'll ha- also have it linked in the show notes below. So just click on that and have a little bit more of a, a read in detail or just give the guys a call if you're wanting to actually understand a bit more about this. But 
really, I, I don't want to say storm in a teacup because there's certainly some changes here. But I feel like when I first started reading these, I, I was concerned. And I remember jumping straight on the phone to you and being like, Beck, what, what do we do? And, what, what? and then within about 20 minutes, I'm like, oh, actually, this isn't so bad. So I think if anyone else is feeling that way, you've got property in South Australia or you're thinking about buying property in South Australia, then just have a little bit more of a look into it with a level head. All right, Beck, but before we part ways today, is there any other final words of wisdom on this subject that you wanted to leave our audience with today? Look, we're getting calls on this all the time. So if anybody has a question or query, more than happy for them to pick up the phone and we can run through any concern that they have. Easy as. Beck Dave from Trove Property Management, thank you so much for jumping on the show. Pleasure.